Good evening. evening. Sisters and brothers in Christ, welcome to Liverpool Hope University and our chapel. My name is John Sullivan. I'm an emeritus professor of Christian education, now retired uh, from this university. Welcome to the first of a series of seven talks to support our synod process. But let's begin as we should in all our endeavours, by placing ourselves in the presence of God and asking God's guidance and blessing on our reflections. I'm hoping that uh, in a second now the prayer is going to come up that we have been using for the last few weeks and months to get ready for the Synod. So may I invite you to join me as we say this prayer together. Father, we thank you for the love you have shown us in the gift of Jesus, your Son. We thank you for the gift of the Church through which you show us that you are always with us and are always at work in our lives. As we journey together to Synod 2020, Help us to become the church that you are calling us to be. May your Holy Spirit be powerfully at work among us. Strengthen each of us and guide Francis, our Pope, and Malcolm, our Archbishop. Help us to respond to the challenges of our time in your ways. To bring your love to all our sisters and brothers, we make this prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Blessed John Henry Newman, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As I said, welcome to Liverpool Hope, to the first of seven monthly lectures that have been um, planned to support our reflections and preparations for next October's Synod 2020. You'll hear at the end a little bit about the next one in November. But it's my pleasure now to introduce to you tonight's speaker, Father Jerry O'Hanlon. Father Jerry entered the Jesuits in 1965. He was ordained in 1978. For many years he taught uh, at the Milltown Institute in Dublin. He's a specialist in the area of social theology and church renewal. For six years, he was provincial of his order. And since 2005, he has been at the Jesuit Center for Faith and Justice. He was invited tonight to speak to us to begin this series because a few months ago, someone kindly introduced me to this book, which I see that many of you were looking at uh, in the stall outside. Um, It it seemed the quiet revolution of Pope Francis, a synodal Catholic church in Ireland, seemed that there would be many similar themes that are relevant to us tonight. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Father Jerry O'Hanlon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Thanks so much, John, for your uh, words. And I want to thank uh, Father Stephen Pritchard as well for the original invitation. Um, I could see from the start that Stephen was a wise man. In our first phone conversation, I tried to get him to come down on the side of either Liverpool or Everton. Who did he support? And he sidestepped it very adroitly. So it's an exciting time in the church and a disastrous time. It's, it's interesting. Those two things do sometimes go together. Uh, you're part now of uh, a movement that is taking place in Rome, the Synod on the Amazon, with all the important topics that are being discussed. Um, a number of dioceses in France are doing the same. The French bishops are studying the whole concept of synodality. Uh, 
The German bishops, as you probably know, have committed themselves to a binding synodal process. There's a good deal of tension within Germany and between Germany and Rome about that, and yet it's, it's continuing. I have some contacts in Australia, and you know the Australian church has been very badly hit by the sexual abuse issue. And at one level, it's on its knees. And at another level, because they're having this plenary council next year, they've had enormous participation in the preparation for that plenary council. In Ireland, too, we had a synod in Limerick, and we've had a number of assemblies in uh, other dioceses. So there's something happening within the Catholic Church that hasn't been happening for about a thousand years. And I suppose when we're in the middle of, of history, sometimes we don't notice it's happening. And yet there is something quite extraordinary that's going on here. Let me begin, though, not talking about synodality, but talking in the way that John did when he introduced us to that prayer this evening. Talking about what's at the core of this, because church reform on its own is not that important. It is important, but it's only important if in some way it makes the church more attractive and more accessible to us in our relationship with Jesus Christ. So the faith encounter with Jesus is at the core. And you remember in various passages in the scripture, but I think of one in particular where Jesus looked at the rich young man and he looked steadily at him and loved him. And that kind of gaze of love was replicated so many times with Mary Magdalene, with the women disciples, with Peter, with John, the beloved disciple, throughout the life of Jesus. And in some sense, that's what we're called to be, disciples who in some sense experience that love of Jesus Christ. And all of us have experienced love in different kinds of ways and maybe the breakdown of love. It's not a simple concept. I remember listening to an Irish theologian from Donegal, Gráinne Doherty, talking about love. And she told us how when she was young, she worked as a waitress in a cafe in Donegal. And she'd see these couples at the table and they were invariably last out and they'd be looking into one another's eyes and she could see that was love, that was love. And then she'd go home to her mother and father and see them grouchy and going around the house. And she'd say, they obviously never experienced anything like love. And yet years later, of course, she talked about the time when her father was dying and the family had a roster of looking after the father. And the father was quite disturbed physically and emotionally and spiritually. And it wasn't an easy dying. And he was restless and looked a bit in pain. And she noticed a pattern developing. That when her mother came into the room, even though she said nothing, even though the father didn't seem to recognize her, he got quiet. So you, I'm quite sure, throughout your life have experienced different facets of love. I think at the core of it, and it's worth trying to excavate this a bit for ourselves, at the core of human love and of the love of God for, for us is this sense of unworthiness. Why me? How did I deserve, or did I deserve, or if I didn't, what is this? This sense of just pure gift. And I suppose that's what we're all called to nourish in ourselves. And for some of us, it's not that easy. Our faith may not come across always as a relationship of love. It may be a more intellectual thing. It may be a certain haunting that's magnetic. We're somehow drawn back, even though we're disappointed so many times. Francis Thompson, the hound of heaven, God chasing us, if you like. Whatever way it is, it's worth trying to dwell on that a bit uh, as part of the synodal process. The marvelous love of Jesus Christ, 
And Pope Francis is very interesting on that because, as you know, from the very first interview he gave, he experiences the love of God. And I suppose it's very true to what St. Ignatius would say in the spiritual exercises. He'd say the privileged place of the encounter is the caress of the mercy of Jesus Christ towards my sin. So that sense that he has sinned, is unworthy, and yet somehow God loves him deeply. And that's a great grace. It's, it's a wonderful um, that we can all ask for. Um, he talks about an encounter with Jesus Christ rather than just a relationship. But he wants to, I suppose, stress the fact that it's dynamic. It's not something that's dead. And Pope Benedict as well, very interestingly, Benedict, you mightn't associate it with him, but he used erotic language in talking about God's love for us, not just the language of agape, but the language of eros, God's passion for us. God loves us so intensely and so deeply. I think sometimes our Catholicism has been experienced and seen in terms of doctrine and teaching uh, and maybe ethics doing well. And doctrine is important and ethics, of course, is very important. But Benedict again said something which goes deeper and Francis picks him up on it and uses the quote from Benedict again and again. Benedict said, being a Christian is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. So that sense of being affected by a relationship. Obviously then, that love is not just for me individually, it's for us as a group, the people of God, and the church, the ecclesia. And I suppose it's very clear from the way it's presented in the scripture in the New Testament that God's spirit is accompanying the people as well as the individual. And so that notion of discernment and communal discernment is precisely what you're doing as part of this synodal process. You're trying to identify what it is in Liverpool, in your lives as Christians as Catholics that you're being called to and you can be confident that the spirit is there uh, leading I suppose as part of that then just to say this it's, it's worth saying it at this stage because again you'll be having lots of other lectures you'll be having lots of meetings and then you'll be having the synod process itself and if you're human beings which you seem to me to be human beings you'll fight and there will be moments of uncertainty and there will be conflict. Um, and because we're part of a culture that can be very adversarial and can categorize people and write people out of reckoning, we need to be reminded that we're invited into a space of freedom and, and real respect for what the other is saying. St. Ignatius of Loyola had this to say, to the director of the spiritual exercises uh, as part of the attitude that that person might have with somebody he was accompanying or she was accompanying. He said, every good Christian is more ready to put a good interpretation on another statement than to condemn it as false. That can sound naive in the era of Trump and Brexit, dare I say, uh, to actually try to maintain a civil discourse, not to get caught into the biases of my own tribe, but to allow other insights to resonate with me. And that's not easy. And I think that's what you're being called uh, to, to be part of. As part then of the relationship, uh, there comes a desire to spread the good news, mission. I was just saying to Stephen today, as in Liverpool, I'm sure, is the same as Dublin today. Uh, there's climate change. Um, 
demonstrations and watching it on television before I came over here uh, this afternoon, watching it this morning, a lot of the demonstrators, and there were younger people, were talking about their mission, quite unapologetically talking about their mission. And that's a, a, a phrase almost that we've lost sight of sometimes. You know, we, we're so engrossed in our own pain as church and our own difficulties. And Pope Francis is, is calling us that all the time. This is outward looking. It's, we believe we have good news to share with the world. And the, the shape of the church, if you like, should be such that that good news is more possible to bring to people. And the good news is contained in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 25, to seek for justice and peace, to care for the poor, to care for the earth, to tell all that God is love and loves each of us. Francis, as you know, dreams of a poor church for the poor. And again, for those of us who are coming from middle class or wealthy backgrounds, that can be challenging. And yet again, we're asking for the generosity to be open to hearing what it might mean for us. I just want to finish this part, if you like, by returning again just to your relationship with Jesus Christ, however that is for you. No good me putting words on it in a sense. The invitation is for you to find what's appropriate for you. But don't underestimate the importance of it. Don't underestimate the gaze of love. Jesus looking at you, saying, I love you, follow me. And Pope Francis is wonderful there. He says in one of his lesser known uh, letters, the Lord asks everything of us, and in return he offers us true life, the happiness for which we were created. And listen to this. He wants us to be saints and not to settle for a bland and mediocre existence. So sometimes because our age is very highly secularized and a lot of younger people aren't coming to church anymore and so on, we imagine that if we could get people even a tiny bit interested, it would be great. And this is much more challenging and much more interesting. You're being asked for everything here. Not that you become a priest or a nun, that's not the point. As a married person, as a single person, as a divorced person, as a gay person, as a worker, as an unemployed person, that's where Jesus meets you and asks for everything and will give everything. And he breaks down that word holiness or saint. I think most of us, I, I don't know, we can do it in the discussion afterwards, most of us would be shy at saying we want to be holy or we want to be a saint. And yet that's what we're called to be. And he breaks it down in a way that's very interesting. He talks about the holiness which grows through small gestures. Here is an example, he says. A woman goes shopping. She meets a neighbor and they begin to speak. And the gossip starts. But she says in her heart, no, I will not speak badly of anyone. This is a step forward in holiness. Later at home, one of our children wants to talk to her about his hopes and dreams, and even though she is tired, she sits down and listens with patience and love. That is another sacrifice that brings holiness. Later, she experiences some anxiety, but recalling the love of the Virgin Mary, she takes her rosary and prays with faith. Yet another path of holiness. Later still, she goes out onto the street, encounters a poor person, and stops to say a kind word to him. One more step. These are very ordinary things. These are things that could happen to any of us any day. And we don't think of them, if you like, as being part of some mystical program. And yet that's the way Francis sees them. Okay, so just to finish up this part, um, our church has been hit by a lot of scandals, and in many 
context. I'm not sure about Liverpool. I don't know it well enough. I know the Irish situation. There is an air of defeatism or demoralization um, about rather than this sense of mission and joy that the Gospels talk about. How can that change? Well, one way is precisely what Archbishop Mann is doing by calling, convoking a synod. Addressing the Limerick Synod before uh, it began, in other words, about the same stage of the preparations as we're at now, the Dominican Paul Philibert said that a synod is a way of spiritually refounding a diocese, that we are all called to be agents and not just clients of the church's mission, full-time and not just part-time Christians through our baptismal callings, so that in our families, our work, our struggles with unemployment and poverty, our questions and doubts about faith in the church, we live our vocation to nothing less than holiness, each of us. Let me turn to the second thing I want to say. I just want to talk a bit about the context that we're doing this in, this synodal process and this responding to the invitation of Jesus Christ. You're probably familiar with the findings of the recently published British Social Attitudes Survey, which found that the number of people identifying as Christians in Britain had declined from 66% in 1983 to 38% this year. Anglicans fell from 40 to 22 percent and Catholics from 10 to 7 percent. You will know about your own uh, archdiocese. Mass attendance has declined from more than a quarter of a million 50 years ago to 41,000 today. Churches are closing or merging Of the 133 active diocesan priests, only 25 are aged under 50, and there has been an expansion of lay ministry. Archbishop McMahon is clear that the Church's authority has been diminished by the scandal of clerical child sexual abuse and its mishandling. He is also clear that the Church needs to be with the poor. He talks about the positive value of the Diocesan Pastor Reformation Program, the Justice and Peace Commission, and other works that are going on. I would add to that, add to the scandals, if you like, the fact that it's also the case that many Catholics today, and particularly younger Catholics, have not received aspects of church teaching on sexuality and gender. By received, I mean they haven't internalized them and accepted them as true for their lives. And that is particularly true of the role of women in the church, but it's also true of other contentious um, sexual issues, which you're well aware of. All that represents a significant obstacle to credibility, especially among younger people. And echoes of that appear in your consultative uh, process, uh, some of which I've, I've read. Going outside the church then, you know that we're in a particular stage of history in civil society at home here in Britain and abroad, which can be quite disturbing, divisive, and confusing. At home here, you have the turmoil around Brexit, and there's a kind of coarsening of public debate and discourse, which is often exclusively polemical and devoid of an ability to listen to people of different opinions and views. So, for example... Valid criticism of the European Union is often dismissed in a rush to partisanship fostered by social media, whereas on the other side, there can be a dismissal of any expert analysis and criticism of Brexit, for example, as project fear or fake news, 
in a society which is often described as post-truth. You can see, too, the depths of division in America, in Trump's America. The authoritarianism and populism so evident in Turkey, Hungary, Italy, not to mention further afield. And Pope Francis, for one, has expressed concern about the kind of rhetoric accompanying these trends, likening them to what was heard in pre-World War II times in the 30s. What's going on at a deeper level? Michael Curran is a British Jesuit. He gives an interesting read. He talks about what's happening in postmodern culture and he says, explanations trying to explain grand narratives, explanations trying to say what's going on, are very contentious now and fragmented. Authority is resisted, even well-grounded authority. There's a lot of pessimism, even cynicism, with regard to the common good. We're strong on the individual, but we're not so good on, on being able to work together. An affirmative approach to our culture's honoring of human dignity can easily topple over into a kind of walled-in autonomy, a buffered and defend itself, which is little time for the common good, not to mention a deafness to transcendence. It's almost as if the focus on choice and the individual have left even those who applaud it with so many choices and so few frames of reference that it's quite confusing. And there's a real absence of meaning and a felt absence of that. There are resonances of that kind of analysis in the Uruguayan intellectual Alberto Metol Ferre. He greatly influenced uh, the Pope before he became Pope. And he noticed, Ferry noticed, with the collapse of the Berlin War, Wall and Marxism that there developed an untrammeled model of capitalism which thrives on an entirely autonomous competitive notion of the individual, a kind of Darwinian survival of the fittest. And it's a breeding ground for inequality and ecological degradation. I think the important thing is here to notice what Ferre says about what the reaction of the church might be. And I think Kerwin shares this. It can be threefold. One, a kind of uncritical acceptance of the Enlightenment and secularism. A naive acceptance of the secular and a tendency towards ecclesial invisibility. So it's almost as if we, we've lost our distinctiveness and we take Rahner's anonymous Christian to an absurd level. It's no longer important to have that explicit relationship with Jesus Christ. That's one possible reaction. The second reaction is an entirely reactionary turn which quickly becomes nostalgic and self-referential. That evil world out there is gone to the dogs. And we're very familiar with that kind of approach as well. It's often referred to now politically as the Benedict option, not after Pope Benedict, but after um, St. Benedict, but a misunderstanding, I think, of St. Benedict in the sense of turning one's back on the world. The third possible response, and this, I think, is what lies behind what Archbishop McMahon and what you're trying to do here, is an enculturated, engaged dialogue with our world, discerning truth and error in the light of our encounter with Jesus Christ. In other words, being open to what's good in the world and being able to name that, and at the same time not being afraid to be countercultural. There's an Irish theologian called Michael Conway, and he's some th interesting observations about that. So if we want to engage in that dialogue with one another and with the surrounding civil society, what might we be looking out for? And why is synodality such a suitable way of doing it? He would say that the search for faith now is conducted not so much at the level of reason and argument, but rather on the wavelength of feeling, desire, and imagination. And with attitudes and assumptions 
often unconsciously adopted through social media. There will always be room for apologetics. There will always be room for intellectual working out of things. And yet what he's saying is that our culture is not as susceptible to that kind of approach as it was 40 years ago. It touches into experience, to feeling, to uh, imagination. And in the kind of phrase that's become a cliché, a deferential experience of authority has given way to the authority of experience. So instead of being very deferential towards authority figures, we rely more on our own experience. And so storytelling, narrative, is likely to communicate more effectively than apologetics and metaphysics. And again and again, that's what we see in reality TV shows and certainly the last two referenda in Ireland on abortion and then on same-sex marriage were conducted on both sides, largely through the t telling of stories, personal experiences, rather than arguing out the points in a very um, academic kind of way. So that's the kind of culture we're in. Um, and then the decline of the institutional power of the church for reasons which we all know is part of a decline of institutions in general. So it's not just the church. There's the decline of social hierarchies, in particular patriarchy, of course. And authenticity is deemed more important than formal office. So if somebody is talking from their experience of being true to themselves, that has more mileage than the fact that one is an archbishop or a prime minister or whatever. Now, always when one gets into this kind of analysis, one can be too black and white. Obviously, the office is still important. Um, but nonetheless, these are trends. And so Conway goes on further, taking from people like Charles Taylor, and he talks about uh, our society today is more egalitarian, enormous appreciation for the human person and for authenticity, enormous appreciation for marginalized voices which previously were silenced. So the LGBT community, for example, voices of children, clearly the voices of um, women. Equality and freedom, especially freedom of choice, are greatly valued. So just in that kind of new context, and some of this has to be challenged, of course. I mean, it's not all um, to be accepted uh, carte blanche, but nonetheless it's a bit like if this is the language spe people are, are speaking and we don't know it and we're not able to use that kind of language then it's like we're speaking in a foreign language and we're not really able to communicate what is important. And so in this new context, this evolving cultural context what Conway says is that the church has to become a less top-down, command-and-obey type of institution and teaching and communication. And it has to encourage more open space interaction, nourished by the gospel and common life, which facilitates an adult taking of responsibility for our lives of faith. So go back to what Philibert said, that you're being invited to be agents not simply clients. And this is a, a different way, if you like, of, of being, and it's much more in tune with the culture. Conway concludes by saying of the Catholic Church in Ireland, but I think it has wider application. He says, I think we can see that the once powerful monolithic institution is being slowly disempowered, and what remains will need to be reshaped into a new, more culturally appropriate constellation. And that's what the Synodal Church is about. That's the new constellation, if you like, the new shape of the church, which tries to be more inclusive, more participative. And I want to give some of the theological reasons for that. Uh, but first, just to finish this part by saying there's a 
sociologist of religion. She originally comes from Ireland, but she professes now in the United States, Michelle Dillon. And she talks about post-secular Catholicism. And she talks about the sense that societies like Germany and France, which have become very secularized, are beginning to have that they still want to hear something of the Christian message. Habermas, for example, the great German intellectual, talks about the something missing which religion, and particular Christianity, represents. And she says that there is an opportunity for the church in that context. But if it's to take that opportunity, it has to be a different form of Christianity than the one we got used to, certainly up to Vatican II and was held on to afterwards by many after Vatican II in the sense of that kind of top-down uh, teaching that I've spoken about. And she says, once you begin to talk about things and have fora like you will have uh, over these three years, once you begin to do that, the cat is out of the bag. So you can't continue then to maintain certain positions which everybody knows are not held by most people and yet are still held officially. That can only go on as long as discussion is forbidden. But once you open up discussion, something new happens. There's a, a patristic scholar, um, very distinguished man, Yaroslav Pelikan. He, again, is from the United States, but I think he comes from Middle Europe. And he has an aphorism which is very interesting in this context, and I think it's worth sharing with you and... Um, see what you make of it. He says, tradition is the living faith of the dead. Traditionalism is the dead faith of the living. And I suppose I should add, he says, it is traditionalism that gives tradition such a bad name. <laughs> so it's always been so that we, especially in the Catholic branch of Christianity, that we respect tradition and yet at her best, as with Cardinal Newman, it's a living tradition. It develops. And I suppose we're in a phase now with this concept of synodality where that becomes more po possible. Okay, so what the Pope is saying is that with a synodal church, if we can bring that about, not easy, if we can bring it about, he thinks that we have a real mission to the world. And it's very interesting the way he couches it. Remember, he's very critical of climate change, the, that issue. He's very critical of the sort of punch and duty, the coarsening of public debate. He's very critical of people's attitude towards migrants and so on. And yet he's able to say this. A citadel church is like a standard lifted up among the nations in a world which, while calling for participation, solidarity, and transparency in public administration, often confines the fate of entire peoples to the grasp of small but powerful groups. So there's some opportunity for the church to model something here, which corresponds to the aspirations of world leaders, but aspirations which so often uh, fail. So let me now just give you briefly some of the historical background to synodality. The 201A text of the International Theological Commission is a good source of that. So they say there, Jesus led by the Spirit, proclaims the good news of the kingdom of God, invites us as the baptized and as church to walk together as the people of God eh, of the new covenant. A particularly transparent example of that occurs in Luke 24, the road to Emmaus, where you have that story of Jesus and the two disciples. The Acts of the Apostles outlines some important moments along the path of the Apostolic Church when the people of God is called as a community to discern the will of the risen Lord. We sometimes think that conflict and 
important issues which we despair of ever resolving are peculiar to our age. We're a church which was founded on conflict. That early generation of the church had to deal with the huge issue of whether Jesus came just for the Jews or whether the Gentiles were also included. And they fought like cats and dogs about that. And there were public disagreements between Paul and Peter. And although if you look at Acts and you look at Galatians, you would think that it was all more or less overnight or something, Scripture scholars tell us this went on for decades in the early church. And yet, they found a way to do it. And the way they did it in the end was at the Apostolic Council of Jerusalem, when the church gathered at Jerusalem. It wasn't done by a pope. It was done by the group coming together, listening to one another, debating about it. And that's, if you like, the the synodal event which is at the basis of a synodal church. And it's the paradigm for synods which have occurred later. And it's from there that that phrase comes, it has been decided by the Holy Spirit and ourselves. This is the phrase that was used. And that's always used in ecumenical councils afterwards. Uh, And of course it was confirmed then by the community in Antioch who were filled with joy. So early on in the early centuries, especially the first millennium, there were many forms of synods and councils uh, with a variety of different cultures and social situations. Synods were called in local situations, but always conscious of being in communion with the larger church. And gradually the church in Rome began to exercise a particular primacy. 325 was the first globalized, if you like, ecumenical Council of Nicaea, and the first universal expression of that path of synodality. Down through the years, there have been local, intermediate, and then universal expressions, and that took place all through the history of the church, but particularly in the first millennium. Gradually in the second millennium, often for very good reasons, and particularly after Trent, there developed what Kungar called the hierarchological uh, model of the church. And the synodal conciliar uh, model became less prevalent. And there developed, particularly in the uh, 19th and 20th century, the notion of the ecclesia docens, the teaching church, and the ecclesia discens, the learning church. And the teaching church were the clerics and the pope and the bishops. And your job as lay people was to obey and to learn. So that was, that was a development, if you like. It wasn't always so. Um, and in particular, this document from the International Theological Commission, along with another document they did about the sense of the faith, uh, refers back to Newman again. And... After that council in 325, when they were discussing who Jesus Christ was, was he man, was he God, was he both, uh, there was a long period, 40, 50, 60 years, of dispute about that. It was all in response to Arius. And then there was a sort of position which began to develop among the bishops, which subsequently be called, was called semi-Arianism. So a, a watered-down version of Arius, but still not true to Nicaea. And Newman, in his looking back at that period, would say that while the bishops in general strayed, the people did not. And that phrase comes up again and again in Newman and then comes up in Vatican II, the sense of the faithful. So the lived experience of people Uh, from their own experience of life and the way they pray and so on, as having input into the formation of doctrine and of ethics. Just finally on the historical thing, just to say that that synodal tradition was preserved much better in Protestantism and in the Orthodox Church. Um, And particular interest to to us here and, and to those of you who are involved in the preparing of the synod, 
is the archic document that was published in 2018, the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, the third document, because they, they did a very interesting thing, receptive ecumenism it was called, where they tried to learn from one another and the strengths and weaknesses of both traditions. And they saw that the Anglican thing was too local, too particular, too parliamentary, didn't allow for discernment. The Catholic thing was too hierarchical, too centralized. And they had some suggestions for breaking that down. Let me come finally to Pope Francis and a synodal church. So what Francis has done is he's directed the church in a very unambiguous way back to the ecclesiology of the Second Vatican Council. So instead of talking about the hierarchical church or even communio, he talks about the church as the people of God, going back to that root metaphor. And the people of God then is characterized by collegiality and conciliarity. In Vatican II, the word collegiality was used to balance the primacy of the Pope with the role of the bishops. So it was primarily still within the hierarchy. What Francis is doing is much more radical. He's saying, when he talks about synodality, he's focusing on the role of all of us as baptized people. So there still remains a role, of course, for Pope, for bishops, for priests, distinctive. But there also is a very important role for uh, baptized uh, lay people. And as part of the, he draws on the theology of um, Vatican II, which says that when each of us is baptized, we get a share in the threefold office of Jesus Christ as priest, prophet, and king. Let's leave priest to one side for the moment. We can come back to it in the discussion afterwards. Prophet means teacher in this context. So you as laity have some role in teaching, in the formation of teaching and in the reception of teaching. King means governance. You as laity have some role in the running of the church. So this is the kind of synodal turn, if you like, that Francis is taking he himself has his own particular twist on it, if you like, when he talks about the sense of the faithful. He's particularly cognizant of the poor, and he's particularly cognizant of popular piety, which is interesting. That's a thing which we often don't do, and particularly those of us in academia don't do. We, we, we find it harder to tap into that, and yet he's there with that. But what he's hoping to offer is a more inclusive, participative conversational space in which individuals can share their experience of their faith, of life, of church, and hope that that will be heard and fed into other conversations. He talks at one stage of an inverted pyramid model of church. So instead of the hierarchy up there, it's the people of God who are up there. And in that sense, I've called it a revolutionary paradigm. I'm not the only one, as many have called it that. It values decentralization. It values subsidiarity. It values consultation and open debate. So although nobody has formally said, for example, you can now discuss the ordination of women, people are discussing it. And nobody can stop. And that's, if you like, the signal is coming from on top there about the fact that we now need, if we're to be apostolically effective, we need a different um, sort of church, one in which open debate um, takes place. It also retains the notion of communal discernment. I find it fascinating that, as you know, probably if you, if you look at the journals or if you look at television programs and so on, there is huge opposition to what he's trying to do. And there are different camps, and they're fighting one another like terriers. Now, you might imagine that in that situation, he'd beat a hasty retreat, keep the head down and say, not a bit of it. So it looks like the more opposition, the further he goes. And he's often said that he values opposition, which is open. It's the passive aggression, which is harder to deal with. 
and he's confident. And I think that some of that comes from his Ignatian background. He's confident that this tool of communal discernment can process uh, this kind of um, opposition. Okay, so he wants a church. He thinks that this is the former church that's needed for the third millennium. He wants a church that's entirely synodal at all levels, parishes, dioceses, conferences, and the universal church. One of the great difficulties, obstacles, will be clericalism. It's trenchant, as you know, in its critique of clericalism. Um, another British Jesuit, Brendan Callaghan, is a psychologist, talks about the gains that come from clergy, from a dysfunctional clericalism, including special status, power, lack of accountability. Um, but he also says gains come for lay people from uh, this kind of dysfunctional clericalism. The gains for laity uh, include the avoidance of responsibility and a clearly defined role. So you can see, <coughs> you can see how that might be true. It's, what you're doing is a very generous thing. You're stepping forward, if you like, and I suppose I was talking to uh, Stephen about this earlier this afternoon that one of the things that you need to factor in here, but maybe it's one step at a time and I don't want to lay this on too thickly, this synod that Archbishop McMahon is calling is wonderful. And it's wonderful that he's had the courage and you've had the generosity to respond. This is not a one-off and shouldn't be a one-off. This is a way of being church. This is something that becomes part of our DNA, part of our corporate habits, if you like. So this shouldn't be something that we're going to solve everything now and next year when we come together for three days. This is an ongoing way of being church uh, into, the, into the future. Okay, just to... Uh, I'm conscious of time, so coming towards the um, end. Um, I think I, I just quote what Francis himself says. It's, it's in The Joy of the Gospel. He says, I dream of a missionary option. That is, a missionary impulse capable of transforming everything so that the church's customs, ways of doing things, times and schedules, language and structures can be suitably challenged for the evangelization of today's world rather than for her own self-preservation. So he's really asking for something very radical here. Um, I think he's a very strategic thinker. He has that aphorism about time being greater than space. And what it means by it is, you go back to that thinker I mentioned earlier, Ferre. It means that don't go for short-term political gains, but go for processes of inclusivity and participation which will affect more lasting change and change that uh, will bear fruit. Let me conclude. <clears throat> Francis knows and says it in his 50th anniversary speech that as a concept, synodality is easy enough to grasp, walking along the way together. The challenge is in translating it into practice. And that's precisely what you're trying to do. On the way, many open and ongoing questions will open up for you here in Liverpool and for the whole church. For example, how doctrine develops. How do we understand that process? The role of women. How create the kind of church suitable for today's world with the possibility of a deliberative and not just consultative role for, for lay faithful. That's one of the things that comes out of the Anglican document, the Anglican Roman Catholic thing. The Anglican experience is that to make the listening effective, in the end you have to give lay people a say in decision making and not just in consultation. I suppose we're still at the point within the Catholic Church where to be consulted is wonderful. <laughs> and if that leads to decisions, we may not need to go the other step, but we may need to go the other step. 
That's why I say it's an ongoing and open question. I think you could be daunted by all of this, especially those of you who are uh, leading this whole process. Uh, but today we actually celebrate the feast of Our Lady of the Rosary. And in the first reading of today's Mass, the reading from Acts, we're told that after the ascension of Jesus, a group of his disciples, including Mary and several women, gathered in an upper room in Jerusalem. You know that notion of gathering together in the room. And earlier they had gathered full of fear of the Jews. This was immediately after the death of Jesus. But that gathering is a synodal gathering. It's, it's comfort, it's encouragement, it's conversation. And in the Gospel today, we read about the Annunciation to Mary and that constant refrain, do not be afraid. You recall the Irish poet Seamus Heaney uh, when he was um, being brought to a hospital for the last time and he knew he was dying. He texted his wife, Mary, and he said, Noli to Mary, don't be afraid. And of course, Seamus at one level had given up the formal practice of the faith and at another level was imbued deeply with the imagination and with the idiom of uh, the faith. So I think you are in that kind of space, really. You're in the upper room. You will continue to be over these next um, 18 months. The planning, it seems to me, to be terrific. You, you have some great people who are uh, leading you. And above all, in this space of communal discernment, you can rely on the Lord. This is the Lord's promise. In the end, these things are very simple. I mean, I suppose one of the characteristics of our age is doubt, and it is secularism and secularization. And I often feel that the verse, I think it's in Mark's Gospel, is very suitable for our age where Jesus meets the man whose son is out of control and wants to heal him and says to the man, do you believe? And the man says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And that's for a lot of us. Do we believe that the Lord is part of this, that the Holy Spirit is among us, leading us gently? And I think if we can trust in that, all kinds of things open up. And at one level, because of the abuse and because of all kinds of things, we're at the foot of the cross, where we should be. And at another level, we're being led towards joy and towards the resurrection. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Father Jerry, for a warm, encouraging um, and succinct overview just what we asked for. Two things in particular you provided for us. One is you've set our synod process in a context in the church, in society, and across history. And the second thing you've offered us is you've shared with us something of the vision of Pope Francis, his vision for the church. <clears throat> 